Lord. My name is Ivaton Kataka. I'm privileged by the Christian Union leaders of UAE to give me an opportunity to share with you concerning living for God. We are going to look at Romans chapter 12 from verse number 1 to 2. And it looks so short, but trust you me, there is quite a lot that we can glean from those two verses. Uh, but even before I take a look and uh, survey the two verses to bring out uh, how we can live for God, I think it's also important to um, raise something that is so critical in our work with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Number one is that we live for God out of gratitude, out of love for the things which he has already done for us. And remember that it's possible for you to live for God simply because there is a kind of benefit you are always looking forward to. In a way, it's like you're doing business with God. You know, like the way you want to say, God, I'm giving you a thousand, give me ten thousand. Those are some of the wrong ways and wrong motives for us to live for God. And we need to look back at Calvary, the work that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross actually give us the reason for us to live with gratitude and to live loving our God and to give ourselves fully to him. Otherwise, there would be no reason to, love, to, to, to live for God. There would be no reason for us to celebrate the work of Christ. Um, if we are not seeing meaning and understanding the magnitude and intensity of the impact and inference that we can draw from uh, from the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the cross. And therefore, our being forgiven and being reconciled to God, it's something so great that humanity has always been looking forward to. We have been looking for an answer to our problems. We have been looking for a moment and a time where we can actually have this wonderful and prosperous relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And therefore remember that if you have to live for God, then it has got to be purely on the basis of gratitude on the fact that God has already done so much for you that he doesn't owe you anything beyond what he has already done. And secondly, out of our love for him, because if we love him, then we would be able to live for him without any other ulterior motivation. Just because he loved us unconditionally, then we should be in a position to actually love our God. And remember, you don't live for God by giving him money. God is not a beggar, you know. Secondly, you don't live for God so that he becomes God. God was there even before we were there. And therefore, it would be tragic to always think that God needs you. Actually, in his sovereign nature and power, our God can actually do so well without us as if we never existed and therefore it's important for us to know that we are God's creation and we were created for his glory we were created for his honor and only for him to accomplish his purpose in the creation in the universe and here we examine Apostle Paul uh, telling us in Romans 12 from verse 1 that I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now he says that I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, which is your reasonable service. And here Paul begins to 
You know, as Romans begin, he examines how God saves us from sin, how God gives us the power over sin, how the Holy Spirit becomes a wonderful companion for us to actually walk with God. And as Paul has Paul has already explained in the previous chapter about man in sin, he has explained about how Christ justified and saved us from our sin. He has explained how we are able to actually overcome sin in our lives. He has explained how the Holy Spirit is our helper for us to live for God. And here he says, therefore, on the basis of all he has said, all the way from verse 1, he is calling believers to live for God. And so therefore, Paul is highlighting three things in these two verses on what we need to do for us to live for God. Number one, he says that we give God our body. And what he definitely means is a definite, and what he really means is a definite commitment of our body to the Lord. And we know that Paul says somewhere in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that our bodies belong to God and the spirit of God actually dwells in us. And so what Paul wants us to do with our body in our living for God is to actually present them to God as a living sacrifice. Now, for you to make sense of us giving our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, we need to go back to Leviticus and see how burnt offerings were actually offered. And that is in, and that is in chapter 1 of Leviticus. You realize that when God commanded an offering to be given to him, the whole of the offering was actually to be placed on the offering, I mean, was actually to be placed at the altar. It was to be burnt whole. There is no way a priest would maybe cut off a leg. And if a priest would actually cut off part of that body and hide it for himself, you will discover that the glory and the power of God would not come down to consume that particular offering. And God wants that we totally dedicate our bodies to him. And therefore, as a believer, you've got to check and ask yourselves, in which way have I fallen short when it comes to offering my body as a living sacrifice? And remember, he says that this is holy. I mean, the, that it should be holy, acceptable to God, and it is our reasonable service. And therefore, as a believer, you cannot just be going out there um essentially indulging sensually indulging your body and thinking that hey okay i'm still a christian i have met some people who normally think and believe that you know if this body will go to hell it is the spirit that will go to heaven and therefore i can do with i can do whatever i want with the body i can indulge in fornication the body is not the one that gets saved now here is a challenge those people who believe that using the body uh, for worldly pleasures does not in any way affect their walk with God. Here is a verse that confirms and tells us that our bodies should be presented holy before our God and as a living sacrifice. And once you gave a sacrifice to God in the Old Testament, that sacrifice, there is no way it would wake up and say, I don't want to be given. And so here is a total, complete dedication to our God. And therefore, we need to give our body to God as a sign that we are living for him. The second way in which we can live for God is actually to give God our mind. It's interesting in verse 2, part A, that it says that we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now I want you to recognize that it is saying renewing of our mind, not removal of our mind. Because there are people who think that they can serve God by removing their minds in the sense that they 
uh, don't think in the sense that they have just decided to 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 follow whatever their church leaders say and they have most people have actually found themselves ending up in cults because they almost read that verse as if it's the removal of your mind no it is not the removal of your mind it is the renewing of our mind and as young people one of the things that we know is that actually our mind is the main target of the enemy simply because it is there that he implants his sinful seeds so that we can translate that and we can translate that into our bodies and as a result we commit sin against god and so paul recognizes the fact that the mind is important when it comes to living for god and that is why he challenges uh, believers and tells them that you have got to consider renewing your mind and when it comes to being to renewing our mind he says don't be conformed to this world and he gives us another picture uh, of 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 what can happen to our mind that when we look at the world there is a way that we can be so attracted to what the world offers and paul tells us that don't be conformed to the world and the world is a system it's not necessarily uh, the physical earth that we were talking about a system it is what challenges us it is what hinders us from actually living for our god and therefore how do we transform our mind i mean how do we get transformed how do we renew our mind we can renew our mind by reading the word of god this is what is a man this is the manual that god has given to us so that we may be able to actually hear him speak to us as we direct and order our steps it is here that our whole it is here that the holy spirit gives us revelation to really understand how god wants us to walk in this world and to and, and and to live for him and you see the mind is renewed from a heart that has actually been transformed because if the heart is not transformed then our mind will operate in confusion and that is why paul is basically telling us that renew your mind and basically he is saying that we need to learn to give god our will if we have to live for him, we have got to give him our will. And the will is one of the most difficult things for man to give to God. Why? Because it pulls us away from God. It takes us to our own way. You know, when someone says, my own way is the best. Yes, that is how it happens. And therefore, friends, we have got to begin asking God, by, to help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to blast our will so that it can be yielded and be conformed to God's will. And when we are talking about giving God our will, we are simply talking about surrendering all our fleshly desires, surrendering sometimes even what we think is right for us and conform it into what God wants. And that is when sometimes we come in conflict. We begin asking ourselves, surely, Lord, this is how I wanted it. If you have to live for God, then you must be in line with his will. It's important and imperative for us to know that we can only choose one. We can only choose one between these two, living for God and living for the world. You cannot live for both. This is what I basically say. That, you know, if you live for the world, it will be very visible. It will be evident. We will just see uh, from your actions that you're living for the world. And it's even very possible to say that actually you're not born again because those who are born again do not live for the world and therefore this is a great call to us that we that we may choose to actually live for god it is never an easy way 
but we have God on our side who is able to lead and to walk with us. He does not abandon us, no. He calls us into a process. He calls us into a journey where he walks with us and he transforms us. And therefore, I think to me I can summarize and say that from those two things, when we give our bodies as a living sacrifice and ensure that we are renewing our minds and yielding our will to God, then we are good to go. There is where we need to carry our cross and trust God. It's not easy, but we can trust that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can actually live for God. And remember that in all this, living for God means trusting and obeying him. Trusting and obeying him. There is actually a benefit for you to actually live for God than for you to live for the world. There is a man in Numbers 21 called Balaam, 21 to 22, uh, called Balaam. And this is a man who wanted to live for God and at the same time to live for the world. I can assure you that he lost it. We have got the prodigal son. He left the father thinking that there is life outside the father. But when he went to live for the world, he discovered that it's very difficult and impossible for one to live a life out there without God. You know what he did? He decided to come back to the father. And the father kept on waiting for the son to come back home. It is the same way that God waits for us who are still uh, lingering and waiting to see what the world can offer. He's waiting to see us coming back to the fold so that he can bless us, so that he can keep us, so that he can sustain and carry us through life challenges and circumstances that we are actually going through. And the prodigal son came back and when we read Luke 15, we see that the father, you know, uh, runs to this sinful son who had gone to live a life outside of him. It's amazing and seeing that this is the one place in the scripture that we see God running towards a sinner to welcome him home and to tell him that I can give you life. I can provide all that you need and despite everything that you have done, I need you to come back to my fold so that I can bless you, so that I can be your father. And therefore, if you haven't been living for God, this is an opportunity to actually call you back and ask you and, and request you to begin to think and reassess where you're standing because for many of us, we may not really be knowing what exactly we want for, for, for our lives. We may not be knowing what exactly we want to do when it comes to us living for God. But he himself will teach you, he himself will walk with you, he himself wants to bless you. And I want to let you know that God is so eager to live and walk with you more than you are so eager to actually live for him. And that is the blessedness of our Lord and Father. That is the blessedness of our Father in heaven because he's always more eager to accomplish great and wonderful things in our lives. And as I bring it to a close, I need to challenge and to let us know that this is a world that is full uh, of its pleasures, it is full of its offers, it is full of money, it is full of wealth, it is full of power. But none of this thing can ever give satisfaction to your soul compared to actually living for God. I may not have the money, I may not have the power, I may not have everything that I ever need, or I may have all these other things, but living for God is the most ultimate. It is the ultimate vision, is the ultimate desire of a Christian who knows 
that this world is transient this world is the way it is and sooner or later god will call things to order and his judgment will be upon nations where would i stand my desire is to see him face to face as he is revealed on the cloud coming with glory and power for he is the one who reads rewards us for he is the one who rewards us for our faithful living in him and therefore brother and sister it's my encouragement to you that you may continue to live for him and be encouraged that God will keep you God will sustain you and ensure that your salvation is protected in him in Jesus name amen let us pray Father we are grateful we thank you for helping us Lord to realize that indeed you are calling us to offer our body our mind and our will to you and we are praying that Lord Jesus by the power of your Holy Spirit give us that empowerment that enablement to live for you even in this shaky world you know that God you can always be with us and sustain us in Jesus name we pray Amen Thank you so much and God bless you